Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Grecia Mujica, and I am here with our great guest, Richard Levitt. And um, today we will be conducting a session with him, um, I, with Pre-Law Shadowers. So thank you so much for everybody's time. And Richard, if you could introduce yourself, please. My name is Richard Levitt, and I have a small firm in Etobicoke. And what I do is wills and estates primarily real estate, uh, residential and commercial real estate law, and corporate law as well. And most of the corporate law that I do is for small business. Uh, we have two other lawyers in the office who do family law. They're the ones who do all the marriage contracts and the prenups and things like that. Uh, there's my dad who started the firm, who's you know, pretty much retired by now. He comes in about once every week or two. So he's got a pretty sweet deal in terms of how often he comes into the office. Um, and then we have about six or seven or maybe eight support staff who help us uh, get the job done. So uh, like I was saying before, before uh, we started recording, I think this is a great initiative and it's a great program. And I wish that when I was in law school uh, that we had something like this, because even for me, uh, I'm a, a guy who comes from a family of lawyers. You know, my dad is a lawyer, my brother, you know, I have uncles. Um, I had no idea in law school what a lawyer does on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that was a pretty common refrain from a lot of people in law school. And the fact that you guys have this opportunity now to talk to lawyers and to find out what we do before you even apply to law school, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's what a lot of people should have been doing all along. So I think this is a great initiative and a great program. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and yes, I completely agree with you, as I was saying, um, you know, and it's thanks to lawyers like you that we get to have these um, sessions and learn more as students about uh, what it is to have a, a career in law. So on that note, the first question I'd like to ask you is, um, at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to pursue a career in law? I think for me, because uh, like I was saying, there's lawyers in the family. So it was always kind of a background option of a career path for me. So if I think back to when I was in undergrad, I think the two options for me were journalism and law. Those were the two things that I was most interested in. Um, I figured, you know, I was not one of these people who was dead set on law from the outset, who always wanted to be a lawyer. I think there's a lot of people who are like that actually. And if you hear from anybody who said they knew what they wanted to do right away, I'd be a little bit reluctant into believing that. I think there's a lot of people even in law school, even after law school, even in their first five, 10 years of being lawyers, that they're still not sure what they want to do with their lives. So it takes some time to figure out. Um, I think for me, you know, I decided it was a very step-by-step -step process. You know, I was an undergrad, you know, I knew law was an option. I decided to write the LSAT. You know, I, I actually wrote the LSAT twice. We can get into that a little bit later, but you know, the second time I did quite well, I ended up going to law school and it was just like, I just took it one step at a time. And in even my first few years in law, I was struggling about whether I wanted to stay as a lawyer, whether I wanted this to be my career, because it's just, it's a very much a feeling out process. But I think, uh, you know, if you asked me when I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer when I knew this was going to be my career. It might sound a little bit strange to say that I'd already been a lawyer for a few years by the time I'd come to that conclusion and that realization. But um you know, like there's so many different things you can do with a law degree. There's so many different things you can do as a lawyer. And I had to feel out for a few years, like a bunch of different things before I found my niche and what it is that worked for me, that I knew that, you know, this is something I could settle into. So it took, you know, a few years into working as a lawyer even before I knew. I mean, that was my path. That may not apply to everybody, but that's how it uh, it worked for me. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, everyone's experience, at least in my experience from conducting these interviews and everything, is very different. Um, and I think, yeah, you're one of the first people to really admit that it might take a couple <laughs> years even after getting, <laughs> you know, after all the hard work of the LSATs and law school to realize that that's really what you want to do. Yeah, um, I've been doing this for 20 years now. Maybe I should let you know when I've decided that this is my career <laughs> path. Maybe it'll dawn on you within the next five, 10 years. <laughs> um, but, you know, you mentioned your your undergrad. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, you you graduated from the from University of Western, right, in philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um. So you know, doing philosophy and everything. Um. Are there any courses in your undergraduate or any experiences like you know any groups that you joined that maybe 
made you want to take the LSAT and pursue law school? I don't think there was any courses that I took in undergrad. But, you know, philosophy is another one of those disciplines where, you know, thinking back to when I was an undergrad, people are always curious to know what you're going to do with your philosophy degree. And if you ever talk to any adults and anybody who's a few years older than you, I mean, this is nothing your peers would ever ask you. But like people, that would always be the subtext of a lot of conversations. Oh, that's so interesting. You're in philosophy. What are you going to do with a philosophy degree, right? And uh, it's it's uh, a lot of people actually in law school. They they come from philosophy backgrounds or political science backgrounds or history backgrounds, where you don't necessarily have that career path set out like you might if you're taking something like business or medicine, where you know you're going to be a doctor, you know you're going to be some type of uh, business person. These are very broad disciplines that teach you critical thinking and things that can apply to a whole variety of things. So, uh, you know, in, in undergrad, if I put myself back to where I was in undergrad, I don't know if there's any specific courses. I mean, I took philosophy of law and it was, it, it, in retrospect, law always was an interest of mine. You know, so I did take those types of courses. It's not like something I would shy away from, like when they were available. I took them because I knew it was a potential career path for me. And I was trying to get a feel for what it's like to be a lawyer. I didn't get it from any of these courses. I can tell you that, like, even in law school, the courses that I took um, do not teach, well, they didn't teach me what it's like to be a day-to-day -day lawyer and what kind of skills you need. And uh, and you really learn on the fly, you know, and maybe that's changed. You know, I've, I've been, all, like I said, almost 20 years now. So, you know, you guys are an undergrad. So, Maybe things have changed, but if they haven't changed, these types of initiatives are exactly what you should be doing. You know, volunteering with, you know, shat like physically shadowing lawyers, volunteering at outreach programs or legal aid programs, going to the courthouse, like seeing what people do on a day-to-day -day basis and getting firsthand experience of that is, I think, the best thing that you can do because the courses, there were, there were no courses. Like they didn't teach me anything in terms of what I'm doing now. They're, they, they teach you how, that you can, uh, you know, meet deadlines and like be a student and you can grasp uh, intellectual concepts in a very general sense, but nothing specific to the practical um, hands-on experience you need to be a day-to-day -day lawyer. Yes, of course. I mean, it does seem very different learning it and actually doing it. Um, so I can only imagine like how it actually is once you get to start doing like, you know, law every day, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, but so going further on to your undergrad, you know, um, in your experience with taking the LSAT, did you take it right after undergrad or did you take some time off or so how was that experience for uh, you? You know, what I did in undergrad and I think maybe uh, the most beneficial things that have helped me in terms of my undergrad experience to being a lawyer is I did two uh, exchange programs. So I did my first program. I lived in Israel for a year. Um, I actually wrote the LSAT. The first time I wrote the LSAT was right after I graduated in London, Ontario at Western. I wasn't ready. I wasn't, it was kind of like something I figured I would just do. I hadn't prepared properly. Um, and I didn't do that well. I mean, I didn't do terribly, but I didn't do that well. And then I wrote it again after, you know, taking a proper LSAT course and practicing and getting my timing down. And, and I will say, uh, I was told at the time that the mark you get on your first try is the mark you're kind of stuck to, and that it's very difficult to improve on a standardized test like that. And that was not the case for me. I mean, I did significantly better the second time around. So if you ever hear from anybody to say like, you know, you're stuck with what you get and that's, you know, it's hard to improve, that was not true at all for me. So, um, you know, I practiced and I got my timing down and I got my confidence up and I was incredibly nervous the first time I took the test and nerves, nerves can play a role. Um, but going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, like the exchange programs, actually I did my last semester of law school in Australia. And, um, you know, you really have to learn to be a lawyer and especially the type of law that I do, you have to be able to relate to people and you have to be able to learn new experiences and learn to uh, relate to people who have their own personal experiences and backgrounds. And traveling for me was really uh, the most beneficial thing I can think of in retrospect. It was like, I learned a lot more from that than than what I was learning in the classroom. Yes, of course. And I mean, when you're saying, you know, you have to practice, I mean, everyone says practice makes perfect, right? but I think it's a bit more intense when it comes to the LSAT since it's such a, you know, 
difficult exam and everything. Um, but pressure too, like there's a lot of pressure <laughs> on yourself and you're timed and uh, you know, you, you, those things though help like being a student in school and taking any type of courses and just being used to the exam mm -hmm. atmosphere, being used to the undergrad pressure of getting your courses done in time, getting your exams done in time, those types of things help. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, you know, also as like a student, I mean, I, I moved around a lot as like growing up and everything. So I've always wanted to travel. And I think that's probably one of my biggest reserves in pursuing law that I was, you know, scared that it would, um, you know, like get in the way of traveling because everyone says, oh, once you become a lawyer, you have to stay in one state and province. And I'm sure that's true to some sense, but it's nice to hear that there are experiences, at least in law school and opportunities to travel and still get to, you know, pursue law. Yeah. Yeah. And not only do I think it's it's possible, I think when you're a student, it's actually beneficial. And, um, you know, another thing that was always told to me when I was in law school was that there's so much you can do with a law degree. Um, but that's kind of where the conversation used to end, right? And I remember, okay, like, there's so much you can do. What is it that you can do? Like, what are all these amazing things? Um, but there are things you can do in terms of travel and the travel is important with life for you. There's there's types of law that you can do that's you know cross border or you can become a politician or a diplomat or you, know, you can use your law degree to kind of get you in the door to to careers that do involve traveling. And if that's something that's important to people, you know, there's there's opportunities there. That's really reassuring to hear that. Um, so, you know, after your LSAT um, and your experience in Osgood Law, um, could you tell us a bit more about, you know, what program you are, uh, you're in and your experience at Osgood Law? My experience at Osgood Law was, you know, it was a very big difference. I remember noticeably thinking that the other students were very smart. I remember thinking that's kind of what hit me. It did not hit me when I changed from high school to university, but it did hit me when I got to law school. You start noticing that the people that you're in class with are very uh, studious. A lot of them are well-spoken. Um, you know, they're uh, driven. Uh, some people can be very competitive, you know, and you, and they're, they're it's just, it was a little bit of a wake up call um, to realizing that like, you know, you're now being marked on a curve with other people who are just as capable and if not more capable than you are and than I was, you know, that was, I remember that was like the, when I think back to the first week or two, that's something I noticed. And that was a little intimidating at the beginning, to be honest with you. Um, but then you settle in and you realize everybody's just human beings, just like you are. And everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, just like you do. Um, and in terms of the courses at Osgood, again, I don't really think it was the material or the content of the courses that are so helpful. There's a huge amount of volume in terms of like what you need to learn and just getting used to uh, retaining that volume of information is helpful. The, the information itself is so much and, you know, there's so many different areas you're learning about. And when you start practicing, you're only going to be practicing in maybe one or two of them. And you're learning a lot of stuff that you're not going to need to know as a practicing lawyer. Um, so, you know, like I think law school maybe was a year too long. Like, I really don't think it should have been three years. I think two years would have been enough. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place to make contacts. Again, if we're talking practically, you know, I have some friends now who I'm still in touch with who, you know, I don't do employment law. I don't do immigration law. There's like, I don't do criminal law, but I have a lot of friends who I went to law school with who do these law areas of law. And I know they're smart. I know they're good people. I know they're going to treat the clients well. And I refer my clients to them and I feel good about referring them to them because I know they're good people and I know uh, that they're going to do a good job for the clients I'm referring. So like, it's great to meet people that you can relate to. There's going to be a lot of people at law school that you don't relate to, like you don't connect with everybody. Um, but, you know, the handful of people that I did relate to and connected with, I'm still in touch with. And that was that was like a, a, a good experience through law school. The, again, the content of the courses, you know, they weren't so useful for me in terms of being an everyday practicing lawyer. Uh, and you can see that when you start practicing law, all the other lawyers who are like five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out, when you start working, they don't expect you to know anything. Like you come out thinking like, okay, I went three years to law school, like I'm a lawyer now. And you will realize, and I know you guys aren't at this stage yet because you're an undergrad, 
but you would realize that once you have that designation of, of lawyer to the general public, everybody thinks you know the law. Everybody thinks you're a lawyer now, you know everything and you have all the answers. But other lawyers know you know nothing. And it took a while for me to understand that I knew nothing. Um, and when you have clients who are looking to you for answers, it takes a while for you to be comfortable in your own skin and to admit to yourself and to your clients that you don't have the answers right away and you have to look into things. But, you know, I remember actually, you know, renting my first apartment and the landlord knew that I was just graduating law school. And he said, oh, you know the lease and you know the law and you know this better than me. And I knew nothing. Like I knew there's no way I knew better than him because he'd been renting his place to tenants for the last 20 years. And I'd never been a tenant before. I'd never seen a lease before. And like, but people have this expectation that you know a lot more than you actually do. And sometimes you feel pressured to pretend like you know what you don't know. And for me, that was stressful. Like I used to remember thinking like, I'm supposed to know these things, but you know, and I, I, you, you're not, and you, you learn on the fly and uh, you learn with life experience and with experience doing the job. You don't, they don't teach you this stuff in school. Of course, I mean, you know, learn by doing. Um, but, you know, I, I think we do, uh, most students, at least, as as you said, you know, we we leave undergraduate and we leave law school probably being like, oh, yeah, I know everything. And then uh, we get to the reality and it's it's not what everyone thinks it is. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. But um, so, you know, are there any courses specifically that you think, although, you know, you it probably didn't prepare you as you thought it would. Are there any courses that you did think that maybe helped you in choosing like your like your the field that you wanted to be in? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like if you want to go to law school, you have to do well. Your grades have to be strong. So it, it helps to take courses that you're strong at, right? Like if you're looking to go to law school, you're not, it's not the time to experiment and take courses that like, you know, you think might be interesting, but you might find out that you're actually terrible at it, or maybe not that you're terrible at it. For me, if I if I didn't find material interesting, then I would not do well in the course. If I found material interesting, then I would do well in the course. If, sometimes it was all on the teacher, right? Like if you have a good professor, it doesn't really matter about the material. Like the professors kind of uh, govern whether or not you're gonna have uh, interest in the course material and do well. So I kind of structured my courses around um, my strengths, and, you know, um, my strengths are reading and writing and, uh, you know, multiple choice tests. Like I took a lot of psychology and philosophy, not, you know, philosophy was a lot of writing and essays, but there was still, like philosophy of law, I remember was multiple choice and that was a strength of mine. And, uh, you know, I just kind of took courses that, that catered to my strengths and catered to my interests. And that's what helped me get into law school. But I don't really remember being in law school thinking like, oh, wow, I'm glad I took this philosophy of law course because I know so much about the law right now. Like there, there were no courses that really um, prepared me for the content of the law materials and the law courses. Um, so if people are thinking about going to law school, I wouldn't think about so much about, uh, and this is my personal advice, my personal experience may not apply to everybody, but I, I wouldn't think, you know, what's going to help me in law school, what's going to help me do better in law school, I'd think, what's going to help me get into law school. Um, and uh, then when you're in law school, you take the courses that, you know, you think might help you in your career and that that can help. But again, like, like I said, I wasn't one of those people who really had like a set career path who knew what they were going to do. I didn't know the, the areas of law I wanted to get into. I didn't know, like I just took a, a broad array of courses to try and figure it out. And I didn't even figure it out until I'd been practicing for a few years and I tried a bunch of different areas myself. Of course. Um, and so I know that your firm, you know, um, ha deals with a lot of different fields of law. Um, but, you know, do you feel like you deal with one specifically like more than others? Um, and if so, you know, how did you get into that area specifically? Um, so, uh, I did try out a bunch of different things when I was starting out. When I was in law school, the most interesting courses to me were actually criminal law. And, uh, the cases are incredibly fascinating. You know, there's cr criminals in the criminal mind, like there people just do crazy things. I mean, they, it's just the, the cases were, I just thought was very interesting. But as soon as I started to become a practicing lawyer, 
And I realized that to be a criminal lawyer, you're dealing with a lot of criminals. Like, you know, you a lot of the people, you know, you, you, on TV, it looks like nobody actually did the, did the crime. But in real life, like a lot of people have done the crime, right? And you have to have a fierce belief in the justice system that everybody deserves a, a fair day in trial. Everybody deserves their right to legal counsel. And, you know, if somebody uh, is guilty, you do the best job you can for them and the justice system will find them guilty, right? But I realized quite quickly that that wasn't the type of thing I wanted to do. Like I didn't want to be dealing with uh, a lot of criminals every day. It just, it just wasn't an interest of mine on a day-to-day -day practice. Even though studying it in the course material, I found amazing. Living it on a day-to-day -day basis, I realized quite quickly wasn't for me. Um, so I was a very much a feeling of process for me. You know, I tried employment law. I tried, you know, going to court. And I think the first thing I decided was I didn't want to be a courtroom lawyer. And that's a big divide between lawyers. Like there's litigators, uh, which are called barristers. And then there's transactional lawyers, which are called solicitors. And I realized quite early on that a solicitor's life was better for me. I didn't like the life of being in a courtroom. Um, whereas my brother is completely different. He's a litigation lawyer and his job is completely different from mine. Um, so I kind of gravitated towards uh, solicitor's work, which is what my dad does or my dad used to do. Um, and, um, you know, I just gravitated towards wills and estates because I found that it's very relatable. You're dealing with regular people. You're helping them deal with regular problems. You're helping, you're getting to know them and their families. You're finding out whether people get along with each other. Do you get along with your siblings? Do your children get along? Are there any fights or disputes? Like I find all that stuff very interesting. And people are generally really appreciative um, when you help them navigate through things like that. Um, and then, so that's what I do primarily, wills and estates. Um, and real estate is another big part of our practice. And again, you're, you know, you're helping people generally in a happy time of their lives. You know, I, I said my other lawyer, there's some other lawyers here who are family lawyers, and they're helping people navigate through like miserable times in their lives. And there's a lot of emotion and a lot of screaming and yelling coming from the family side of the office that doesn't often come from my side of the office. But again, it's a totally different experience and it's a totally different job. So I just gravitated towards wills and estates and to real estate and to business law because you're helping people generally at a happy time, at a time when they're figuring things out, at a time when uh, you know they're 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 navigating through complicated things that they can't do on their own. But um, it doesn't have the high, fast-paced stress of being in the courtroom. It doesn't have that big like adrenaline rush you get when you go to the courtroom, which I think a lot of people appreciate and enjoy. And I understand that, but it wasn't, it was never for me. And um, I think, you know, what I would say to young lawyers is to decide whether you want to be a barrister or a solicitor. You can do a little bit of both, but that was an early decision. And uh, that's a big divide in the legal career path. And another big divide is uh, big firm or small firm. So, you know, working in my firm and working at a big firm are two totally different experiences as well which uh, is another reason I think it's so great that you guys are interviewing all these different lawyers who have different experiences because um, you will get an entirely different perspective on what law school was like and what the courses were like and what the people were like from you know, lawyers at other firms and, and uh, a big firm perspective and the type of clients they deal with are totally different than a small firm like for me and the type of clients that I deal with. So I gravitated towards this stuff because the people generally, you know, the work and the people, people are regular people. They're not um, executives. Like we do have clients who are executives, but that's not the norm where people are uh, fast paced like bankers and Bay Street types. Like they're regular people who don't really want to drive downtown because they don't like to park downtown. And, uh, you know, it's it's helping them and their families and, and people starting businesses. It's, it's a totally different clientele than it would ha I would have if I was a downtown lawyer. Well, thank you. Um, you know, could you explain like your day to day? Because, you know, it is very different probably from, you know, other types of law and, you know, especially their area and stuff. So what, what what's it like, you know, to do uh, wills and estates on a daily day, typical day? I mean, I can say like wills and estates uh, and real estate from a small per firm perspective like mine, my day to day is very much a mixture of running the firm and managing the business and servicing the clients, which are two completely different jobs. So, you know, a normal day for me is 
I spend a lot of time responding to emails. I mean, a lot of times people are asking you quick questions that are not quick questions that do not have the quick answers they think. Uh, I think uh, and a lot of that did come with me, you know, coming coming to realize, you know, when you're a young lawyer and someone says quick question, you think that you need to have a quick answer. But, you know, as you gain some experience, you realize that's not always the case. Um, but there's a lot of responding to emails for me, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with clients who have all different sorts of problems. And when I've been, you know, now that I've been practicing for almost 20 years, I've gained up, a, I've, I've built up a clientele and people turn to me with their issues. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of getting bombarded, you know, like I don't even know how to explain a specific day. I get bombarded. As soon as I get off the phone, somebody's coming into my office with a question. As soon as they leave, somebody else is leaving, somebody's emailing me, somebody's calling me. It's just like onslaught. <laughs> day goes by really fast. Um, and, uh, you know, on top of servicing clients, you're also dealing with employee issues. You're dealing with the website. We're negotiating our lease right now because our lease is coming due. We're renovating our office. You can see my office probably isn't the nicest office you've ever seen, and that's getting all renovated and will hopefully look nicer in the very near future. Um, we're changing software platforms. So the type of software that we use to, to manage our practice is changing. And we're meeting, and, you know, so I'm meeting with our IT guy. We're upgrading our phone system. Like there's all that type of stuff that people don't really see. And then there's dealing with the clients and helping them uh, you know, explaining to a client, why do you need a will? Um, you know, where do you start when you need a will? Um, you know, if a client's passed away, how do you administer an estate? Where do we start, you know? And um, I think some of the things that I enjoy doing is that, you know, I think I'm one of my strengths is explaining to clients in everyday terms, terms that they can understand um, and simplifying things that they are initially very intimidated about because the whole the law doesn't need to be such an intimidating process, but for a lot of people it is. And um, so I spend time just explaining to people in everyday terms, like, you know, what a will is, or, you know, if they're telling me what they want to do with their will, I can explain to them, well, this is the type of will you need. Um, or if people are buying a house or buying a condo or something, I can explain to them, the process and you know selling a house or a condo or you know reviewing a commercial lease um incorporating a company you know like th there's just so many different things but every day is is different and um it's busy you know it's busy and it's uh it's uh another thing i would tell young lawyers and young students is you know like life work life balance is important right and i think that's becoming more and more important uh, to the younger generations than it was to the older generations. I think the older generations had this mentality to just grind through and work as hard as possible. But I think the younger generations have come to realize that like, work is not everything and work-life balance is important. And that was another thing that kind of drew me to manage my own firm. You know, I'm busy, but I, I don't have a boss looking over my shoulder. I can call my own shots. You know, I can dictate the culture in the firm. I don't have to answer to somebody else's culture that I think is ridiculous. You know, I don't have to pretend like I'm working or put in FaceTime when I actually don't have work to do just to make it seem like I'm busy, you know? So there's a lot of advantages to being in a small firm and to being your own boss. But I think to bring it back to your question, a regular day is just, uh, you know, answering emails and answering phones and talking to clients and uh, walking them through whatever their legal issues might be. Well, um, it sounds pretty stressful. <laughs> <laughs> um it's a good thing that you like it <laughs> um but yeah I'm sure there's a lot of freedom in and you know having your own firm and everything all, all, despite the stress and your busyness and everything yeah. um but you know that being said would you say that you know that is probably your favorite thing like what do you think is your favorite thing um about your field specifically or even having your own firm you know it's the people like the 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 the, the, the good clients are great the staff we have here, the team we have here, everybody's great. It's so important to get along with the people you work with. And we do have a really great group of people here at the office. And if you don't like the people you're coming to see at work every day, it really is gonna make your life miserable. Uh, and we're fortunate to have like a really good group of people that everybody gets along with. Cause you're, you're spending every day with a group of people that you're gonna see, you know, in some instances, you know, more than your own family. So, uh, that's probably the best part, you know, like the staff that we work with. And um, 
the clients keep you on your toes. There's like a variety of problems. And um, I think a lot of uh, learning to practice or learning to do what you want to do in law or in a career, you know, if you, even if you don't go into law, a lot of this is learning yourself, learning about yourself, learning what type of work you want to do, learning what type of people you like to be around, learning what type of people you don't want to be around. And the thing that I enjoy is being able to call those shots. And you know what, if I, if there's a client who calls and they're rude or they have a bad energy about them where I can tell it's going to make everybody's life difficult. Like if I could, I, sometimes you can just, they say, there's a saying that 10% of your clients create 90% of your problems. And I really believe that's true. And as you gain years of practice, you start to recognize those clients earlier on in the process than you would have when you first started. And I have the freedom to be able to say, no, I don't want to take you on as a client. No, I don't want you to take up all my time and make my life miserable. And you can start picking and choosing, you know, like it's such a pleasure dealing with good clients and dealing with pleasant people who appreciate your advice and who, um, who need your advice and appreciate your advice. And you can start, you know, nitpicking at like, uh, who you want to work with in terms of like your employees and your team and what type of clients you want to take on. And that freedom is really important. Like that's for me, you know, not being forced to deal with people that I don't want to deal with or I don't have to deal with is, is a, is a big benefit to me. Definitely sounds like a stress manager considering that, you know, you have a lot of other problems and a lot going on. It's nice to have that control of being like, I don't need any more stress. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you said p people in the people you work with are your favorite. So what would you say are your least favorite, you know, the most disadvantageous thing? <laughs> about you know, the, the, the most, the, the least favorite has to be difficult clients, you know, like managing difficult clients, a difficult client can really take up all of your time, you know, and, and also like, um, you know, like I can say like, uh, you know, like one of the greatest things, one of the best things I think about this morning, I had this client come in, she was about 83 or 84 years old. She needed a will, very straightforward, basic stuff, but she had a terrible experience with her previous lawyer. And she was just so happy that I was like giving her solid advice that she, she was so adorable. And she actually gave me a hug at the end of the meeting. And she was so happy that she saw me. It's like such a nice feeling, right? Um, that you're helping somebody who was initially intimidated by lawyers and had a bad experience with another lawyer. And she realizes lawyers are just regular people. A lot of people come in and they'll say, you know, this wasn't as painful as I expected it to be, you know, because you make it, you make them realize that um, lawyers are regular people and you speak to them in everyday language and you don't have to use like snobby language or Latin or, you know, words they don't understand to seem smart. Um, but conversely, like a bad client can really make your life miserable. They can be very demanding. And, um, you know, uh, the other thing that I find difficult is, is billing clients, right? Charging people, you know, and uh, I spend a lot of time thinking like, what's the proper amount to charge? What's reasonable? What's fair? You know, and, uh, you know, I think when you're at... Uh, you know, doing the billing, I think, is probably my least favorite part of the firm. Actually, I know you need to do it to make money. And, you know, big reason people become lawyers is to make money. And I'm not going to deny any of that. But it, billing people isn't really the most, sometimes isn't really the most pleasant experience. You know, it's just I kind of wish that would just all be something separate that somebody else would take care of. Um, so the billing side of things is probably the least the least favorite and the the people and the variety of people and the variety of their problems keeping you like it's very intellectually stimulating in that way so that's probably the best thing um so you know i guess people are can be the best and the worst part of um you know your yeah, job the best and the worst exactly <laughs> yeah. but do you feel like you have a typical client um that comes to your firm a typical client, um, again, where we're located, uh, and because I do real estate and wills and business, you know, it's a very broad range of people right through, you know, somebody who's just, you know, maybe gotten married and had a kid or something. Usually that's when they'll need a will um, or they might be buying their first house. And it goes all the way to people who are in their like 70s, 80s and 90s. And they're just like, they're also reviewing their wills or getting new will done, or maybe they're downsizing into a smaller condo or moving to a retirement facility. So, you know, I think typical clients for us, again, are regular people. 
um, you know, everyday, everyday people, um, but they they range from a whole different types of ages and backgrounds. Um, but again, it's not. It's I would say it, what they aren't typically is um, you know like executives, um, CEOs. You know, like like Bay Street downtown um, is not the type of clientele that we typically cater to, and that I honestly that I'm you know it's not our it's not our um, core type of clientele. Not that like we have clients like this, but it's not the common. You know, if you're asking me what our typical client is like, you know, it, it's it's more just you know regular working class people mostly. Um, so, you know, you deal with a lot of people in general. I feel like since you know it's regular people, you get people of all ages, as you've mentioned, families, you know, like very older people who you know are fixing their wills and everything. Um, but do you ever feel like there's been a case that maybe like really stuck with you, or maybe like you know, has stood out to you in a way um, throughout your years of experience? Um, well, the one case that stands out to me stands out because it has nothing to do with what I do normally, right? So somehow, this was about 10 years ago, I got asked to become, to be an independent lawyer on something called a Mariva injunction. A Mariva injunction is something that, uh, and I'm not a family lawyer, I probably won't explain this properly, but it has to do with freezing a spouse's assets. So let's say you're married and let's say you have a million dollars and the spouse like takes the million dollars and just disappears. So the spouse who's been wronged can get something called a Mariva injunction to freeze those assets or to try and freeze those assets. So the person who's, who's wronging them cannot disappear with all the money. And there was this case where there was this couple who was very wealthy and was you know, in the newspapers at some point, and they, 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 they were friends with royalty, like literal royalty, and they were friends with, you know, politicians and prime ministers, and they were just a very um, public uh, family. So they, I don't think they ever had any kids, and for some reason, the husband decided he was going to take all the money and just disappear. And he went to the such far extent that he actually got plastic surgery to change his facial experience so that his wife could never find him. And she was so dedicated to find him that she became a private investigator. She totally changed her career, learned how to become a private investigator to track him down. And they needed, she got this Mareva injunction where she got access to, she found out where he was living and he was living in these random places in like Oakville and Burlington and uh, small apartments to try and hide from her. And we had to go into his property and search for his computers, search for bank records to find out where he was hiding all his assets. And the police were involved. And I ended up leading the police. There was like four police cars who were, I had no idea what I was doing at the time because it's not something I ever did or have ever done since. I had police cars following me and I was leading the police force into this guy's property. And I remember knocking on the door and all the police officers were hiding behind their cars because they later told me that when you knock on the door, somebody can come out shooting. So they had me knock on the door <laughs> and they had, they all hid. They were all teasing me and laughing about it afterwards. They're like, just so you know, next time after you knock on the door, you should maybe stand to the side. And uh, we knocked on the door and then we ended up, we had to break through and break into the door and search all these guys stuff and try and find all the information we can. And it was just, the whole experience was just crazy. I've never had an experience of, of you know, leading a police force into almost like a raid like that. Like all the neighbors were watching and there was police officers everywhere. And uh, that's what stands out to me just because it was so unusual. Um, and we did find all this crazy stuff and it was a very unusual case, but that's that's what jumps out at me. And I think that the, the moral of all that is I think you can see like how many different areas there are in law and how many different things you can do as a lawyer and like that is like, you know, is being on the field with police officers is totally different what I do as a wills and estates and real estate lawyer. But, you know, if you're a litigation lawyer, that could be part of your regular everyday job if you're in a very specific area like that. And that's just one example of a bunch of different things you can do, right? So um, you can take a career path in all sorts of different ways. 
Yeah, I mean, that case sounds like a movie, <laughs> you know, like it a game straight out of an action movie. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure that you didn't expect that you would deal with those cases after graduating law school. Um, no. <laughs> you know, but speaking about movies, you know, there's a lot of um, misconceptions that we've, as we've been speaking about, you know, um, about law school, about becoming a lawyer. You know, if with, you know, with the media and watching movies like Legally Blonde or, or Suits or something. Um, so do you think there are any misconceptions, you know, um, myths that you'd like to, you know, debunk um, for the students? I think, um, listen, a lot of people think lawyers are greedy. A lot of people think lawyers are dishonest. Uh, a lot of people think lawyers are, um, you know, speak in a way that's intentionally difficult to understand and confuses people uh, to intentionally become misleading. Uh, I think those are the biggest misconceptions people have. And I think lawyers are just like any under, other industry. Like there are people like that, there are lawyers like that, but there are gonna be people like that in any, any industry. I don't think uh, lawyers are really any different from uh, any other career path in terms of um, you know unfortunate characters. Um, so I do my best, you know, I think that's kind of a common theme here. Like I do my best to try and disarm people with by being speaking in everyday language, you know, and you can joke around with people and you can put them at ease and they can realize that like, you're not necessarily uh, meeting with them just so you can make as much money as possible, you know, or charge as much money as possible, or, you know, give them advice that's gonna benefit you over benefiting them. Um, those are the most important things. I mean, I think that's really what a lawyer is meant to do. And uh, I think a lot of people don't expect that, you know, when they meet with lawyers, they're expecting somebody who's trying to take advantage of them sometimes. I mean, in terms of misconceptions, they're expecting somebody who may mislead them, who may um, speak in words that they don't understand. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times that's not the case. Like there are a lot of good lawyers who are trying to help their clients and, uh, you know, speaking of stress, like, you know, uh, it, you get better as you get older at kind of separating your client's stress from your stress. So if your client is going through a stressful situa situation, it's, it's good to be a dispassionate, objective advisor. Um, you know, but sometimes, especially in the earlier years, you take on the stress of your clients and um, I, people should understand that it, it can be a stressful job. Um, and, you know, there's reasons why lawyers charge what they do. You know, you have a lot of staff and you want to make sure your staff are good. And if your staff are paid well, they're going to get better service. Um, you know, you have a lot of overhead and, you know, and you, you spend a lot of time learning to become a lawyer and owning your craft. And there's a lot of value to what we do. And there are, there are reasons why we charge what we charge. When often people think, you know, oh, you're just giving me an answer that you knew off the top of my head, you know, and now you're going to charge me so much money. But if you spent, you know, like 10 years getting to the point where you can answer somebody, give somebody that answer, there's value in that. And I don't think people always understand that or always appreciate that. Definitely. Um, you know, I, I feel like especially, you know, again, these interviews and everything and speaking to different lawyers, it's it's funny because it's like always the same or more or less, you know, the greediness, the dishonesty, you know, people thinking that, you know, their lawyers are rude or something, but, um, you know, you're definitely right, where if you spend so many years, um, you know, honing a skill, then it should be rewarded in a sense. Um, and yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, you and hopefully future, all the students that are watching that want to be future lawyers are people too, you know, it's not like, um, you know, robots or anything. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, so... You know, this last question, so I just wanted to you know, thank you so much. Um, everything you've said has just been fantastic advice and super insightful. Um, but do you have any, uh, like, advice for the upcoming generation of lawyers? Um, I mean, I think it's an, it's an incredibly interesting time to become a lawyer. I think relationships with people are have always been important between lawyers and their clients. And I think it's going to be just as important moving forward, if not more important, because now, with chat GBT and artificial intelligence, I think you know lawyers are really gonna have to distinguish themselves. And I think the best way to distinguish yourself is personal relationships and human interactions and identifying uh, what people's issues are through you know, your experiences. And uh, 
I think, uh, you know, that's one thing that really, like, I think it's the most important thing. And it really is the thing that was not at all taught in law school. Like, I think law school for me missed, you know, the interrelationship part of my day. Like, you ask me, what's a typical part of my day? Often I'm interviewing clients, you know, like when you meet somebody for a real estate transaction, for a business, for a will, you're asking them tons of questions, you know, like, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Like, were you a citizen in Canada? Like, what do you do for your work? You know, like you're interviewing people and you have to have these interpersonal skills um, to be able to deal with people. And for people who are in law school or thinking about going to law school, you know, I would say like get life experience, you know, like travel if you can. And if that's not an option, take extracurriculars, you know, like when I, when I, one of my things I did was I went to a legal aid program and I was dealing with people who, uh, you know, couldn't afford legal advice. And, you know, I probably learned more in that uh, program than I did in any course. Um, you know, Osgood used to have Parkdale Legal Clinic. I don't know if they still do, but I did one in, in Australia called uh, Springvale. It was very similar. It was in Melbourne. And, you know, you're dealing with people and you're helping people. And, you know, not law isn't all about hitting the books and being smart and like knowing the law. A lot of it is about being practical, um, you know, because not every case is going to end up in court and be adjudicated by a judge. A lot of it is going to be just, you know, figured out through people before it gets to that stage. So, um, you know, learn how to deal with people, have life experiences. Um, don't get so caught up in, uh, only the aspect of learning the law that's very important for sure but that's not the only part of being a lawyer and um i think uh that will distinguish keep distinguishing lawyers moving forward is you know their ability to interact with people and communicate with people um and i think that's probably the best thing that they can do yes um i think that you know as students it's easy to get caught up in the academic scholarly aspect of it all. Um, so it's really nice to hear, you know, that there are other things that, you know, are of value and useful um, and resourceful. Like, I would you know, just add one, one thing is that also, I think everybody needs to figure out what works for them, right? The way I practice wills and estates law and real estate law is totally different from the way other people would. And you have to figure out what works for you and what what you will be drawn to I personally found when I was in law school, there was a big push to become a corporate lawyer on Bay Street. Like that was like, make as much money as you can. And people come into law school idealistic. Some people, you know, are going to be a human rights lawyer, or an environmental lawyer, or a criminal lawyer. And that's year one. And by year three, there's a real pressure for everybody to get, you know, you're used to getting the best marks. You're used to doing well and achieving. And in law school, doing well and achieving tends to be valued as, making the most money and getting the jobs that are hardest to get. And if you get offered a job that's hardest to get, it may not be something you want to do, but it's something that I remember people feeling very pressured to take and being unable to turn down because they're getting offered a job that other people aren't being offered. And, you know, people like that, um, some of those people, some of those people did very well and succeeded and this was what they wanted to do and they're still succeeding at it. And other people realize, you know, three, four years in that it just wasn't for them and that, um, you know, it's maybe something that they shouldn't have accepted to begin with. So I think that people should really, you know, don't forget who you are, what works for you, what interests you. Don't, you know, don't get totally sucked into pressures of doing things that you might not want to do. Um, if those are the things you want to do, great. You know, there's nothing wrong with being a corporate Bay Street lawyer. But if you feel like you're getting pressured into that because it's what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is striving for, those probably aren't the best reasons to go into a career path. So, I mean, that would be another piece of advice I would give. There's a real um, push, like a, a peer pressure and pressure among, you know, the academics and the schools, um, you know, because when you get interviewed and these, these firms that are coming to interview students all tend to be a very um, specific type of firm, right? And those, there's a lot of other firms and a lot of other things you can do. So I would just, you know, people should keep that in mind as well. Just try and remember would interest them and that'll be more beneficial in the long run than you know being pressured into doing something that you're doing because other people are doing it or because you feel like you know it's it's difficult to get into so you feel like you should do it just because uh other people aren't getting the same offers 
I mean, definitely peer pressure is uh, can be pretty intense. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's nice to know to stay, stay true to oneself and everything. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your answers and your patience and everything. Um, you know, I appreciate it. All the other students that are watching this appreciate it. Um, and yeah, it's just really helpful. So once again, Richard, thank you so much. And um, yeah, that concludes the recording. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. Thanks for having me.